website at wogmtalk.com. Have a blessed week. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Good morning, Word of God. Can we stand together as we reverence the reading of his word? Can we welcome Calvin Noel back home? We are so blessed by you, Calvin, man. You have, uh, you brought it today with conviction and with passion, and I was moved. Amen? If you have your Bibles, if you would, go with me to the book of Genesis. I want to go to the sixth chapter, Genesis chapter number six. I was over in Bossier ministering there live this past Wednesday, and we were able to stream right back here to Shreveport, so it was a blessing being in our Bossier campus, and they are, uh, they are present there now. Can we give our Bossier campus a shout out this morning? We love you guys. Today is a special day. This is the uh, anniversary, this is the birthday of, uh, uh, of our uh, entering YouTube. So this is a special day. So I thought I would highlight places right now, right now as I speak, that are watching us via YouTube. And we found that 52% of you watching right now on YouTube are not subscribers. Come on, subscribe. Hit the subscribe button and go ahead and subscribe, Word of God. But right now we have people watching from India, the United Kingdom, Canada, South Africa, Brazil, Indonesia, and all over the United States. So can we give our viewers on YouTube on this birthday a shout out? We're, we're blessed to be where you are. And we are also at the River of Life Church in Falk, Arkansas, being streamed right into their sanctuary. So can we give the River Church there in Arkansas a shout out? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we, uh, we want to turn to Genesis chapter 6 as we pick up this morning part 21. Part 21 of the Genesis prophecies. Genesis chapter number 6, if you are there, just say amen. amen. Beginning in verse 1, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. Let's just read that little part out loud. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, so before and after the flood were these giants, and I've heard just about everything you can hear about these giants, that they were dinosaurs, that they were fallen angels, that they were mixed breeds. And so today I figured why not talk about these giants, all right? And it's gonna be relevant, so don't walk out and don't turn the channel. He says, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and bare children unto them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man, beast, creeping thing, fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord would end up saving Noah and his family. A total of eight would be saved from the flood. Verse 11 says, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way before upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. Here's the reason why. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry gift of your Holy Spirit. And I pray right now, Father, for all who would be under the sound of my voice, 
those in our Shreveport and Bossier campuses, those watching this live stream or telecast, I ask, Father, that you would bless our hearing and that by your Holy Spirit we would receive revelation, knowledge, that you'd give us wisdom. We ask you for spiritual understanding. We ask you for a conviction of truth, words of hope, faith, and salvation. I ask now, Father, that you would speak through me the words you would have spoken, that your Holy Spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue, that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer, that I would write on the hearts and minds, on the hearts uh, 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 and minds of your people, your anointed word, removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated. We are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Shreveport Bowles, you're turning to greet those around you before you take your seats. All right, today we pick up part 21, if you're taking notes, part 21 of the Genesis prophecies. And this is part two, part two of the days of Noah. Now, we're coming from what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37, where he said that he would return in a time that would look like it did in the days of Noah. So in, Luke, uh, in the Gospels of Luke in Matthew 24, he, he lists two different judgments that came about in the Old Covenant that would mirror what the day would look like upon his return. And those two days are the days of Noah and the days of Lot when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. There's no doubt in my mind that our culture looks like it did in the days of Noah based on Scripture, and it definitely looks like it did in the days of Lot when God judged Sodom. When you read the, the, the account of the flood, there are some things that pop out it, it, that people read and they can't get over. And so I want to highlight that in verse 4, where what are these giants that were in the earth in those days and also after that? And this is relative. This is something we're all going to walk out of here and be able to apply. And so just stay with me on this. If I didn't, if I didn't see the need for it, we wouldn't be getting into it. There's a, there's a reason why this is in the Word of God. Here's what's been said about these giants. They're dinosaurs. Not that, that, that's, that doesn't fit the definition of the word here. The definition in a Strong's Concordance where you look this word up in Hebrew is Nephilim. And that's not a giant. What we have here, and when you look the word up, Nephilim, is this is the definition, and I'm going to give it to you straight out of Strong's Concordance. It is a bully or tyrant, a giant. A bully or tyrant, a giant. And this is not the only time we read about giants in the Bible. We know that when the children of Israel were called to take the land of promise, we're going to study it here in a minute, when they went to take the land, they were afraid, even wanted to go back to where they came from because there were giants in the land of promise. And you may have heard of David who defeated Goliath who was a giant and became famous over that victory. So we read about these giants in the Old Testament, these uh, um, extra large uh, individuals that th it's debatable about how tall and how large they were, but they were giants. Now, the word itself just means bully or tyrant. Now, if you were using a Strong's Concordance and you looked up a word in Hebrew, Old Testament, or in Greek in the New Testament, a lot of times it'll give you a root to that word. So you can see a definition. It'll say, okay, this definition is based on this also, and it'll give you a root word. So there's a second root word to that word giant in a Strong's Concordance of the Hebrew Bible, and it means to fall or fallen. And that's where a lot of people interpret giants as fallen angels that mixed with humans and had these off-breeds. And some ministers even say that's why God sent the flood, was to exterminate these angel-human mix people. Now, I'm not one that believes that. Don't write me any hate mail and give me a six-page document on why I'm wrong. I get that kind of stuff enough. Uh, just save your time, all right? Uh, if you listen to the whole message, you, you'll see something that's practical for your life that we can apply that'll make perfect sense because I'm going to give you up front my definition based on a strong concordance of what a giant is. And write this down, a fallen bully. A fallen bully. And I don't know about you, but in this world, I see plenty of fallen bullies. 
They don't know Jesus. They don't know the word of God. They're not in line with the Holy Spirit or the will of God. But they take their seats of influence. They take their power. They take their positions. And they try to bully people of faith. So this is relevant to today. And I'm going to show you where this has been a theme throughout the word of God. And it's important we understand this. And I'll explain why here in just a moment. But let me talk about this, uh, uh, these, these fallen bullies. I know some will say these are angel mixed breeds, but when Jesus was asked in Matthew 22, verse 30, about marriage in heaven, and if you were on the earth and you had more than one spouse, and you both were saved, died, and went to heaven, which one would you be married to in heaven? That is an important question, because some of y'all wonder right now, like, wait a minute, please don't send me back to my first husband. Are y'all with me? So that's an important question. And then Jesus responded in Matthew 22, 30. He said, no, in the resurrection, there will be no marriage. We will be like the angels of God, and there will not be marriage. So according to Jesus, there's not a marriage, a unifying of the angels. So I don't think that these are angel mixed breeds. Don't save, save, save the letter, all right? I'm going to get one for sure, even though I say, don't, don't send me that ugly letter. All right? Secondly, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, God establishes this law that nothing can produce outside of its own kind, which means a lemon will never produce an orange, a human could not produce a horse, a cat cannot produce a dog. He, he made a law that everything reproduces after its own kind. And if angels came together with humans and had this new off-breed, then that would be some new kind of... And we're told here that the flood would not even exterminate whatever these giants were because not only were they in the days of flood, the flood, but they would be afterwards, which they are. We read about them in the book of Numbers. We read about them in 1 Samuel 17 when David defeated Goliath. So that's my take. So what I want to talk about today is fallen bullies. And here's my point. Satan used in the garden a snake to talk to Eve. But he's not limited to using a snake to talk to us today. Matter of fact, he can speak to you without anybody being in the room. He can speak to you through somebody. Satan wanted Job to curse God and die. No one actually said that to Job other than his wife. His wife looked at him one day and said, Job, why don't you curse God and die? Well, that is exactly what Satan told God he would make Job do. Now, nobody married here has ever heard their spouse be used by the enemy, I know, right? But there is that one case in Scripture where Job's wife spoke for the enemy. So my point is, is that the enemy uses many pawns. A pawn is just something or someone that's used to advance the enemy's agenda. And so there are many pawns in, that the Bible speaks about that the enemy uses. And I want to give you a scripture that, that, that's important. It's 2 Corinthians 2.11. And it teaches us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices lest he get an advantage over us. And that word devices just means his purpose, his mind, or his thought. In other words, 2 Corinthians 2.11 is saying, if you don't recognize what and who Satan can use, he can get an advantage over you. All right? So giants that told the children of Israel, you can't possess the promised land. Giants that mocked the children of Israel in David's day that had... Uh, the army of Israel afraid to fight when David showed up and defeated Goliath. They all took on the same position, intimidating people of God not to walk into their destiny. And there may be somebody I'm talking to right now that has an enemy of God that is using their seat or their influence or their power or their position to intimidate you. They're nothing more than fallen bullies that are making uh, uh, your faith intolerable. And I world is filled with them, and I'll explain it here in just a minute. But does that make sense so far? Fallen bullies. Well, let me show you what they did in the Old Testament. Go with me to the book of Numbers, and I want to go to the 13th chapter. Numbers chapter 13. And I, I, I have no doubt, because I ministered this at 8 a.m. already, that you're going to walk out of here today, Lord willing, 
And you're going to be able to say, wow, I see these fallen bullies in the earth. People in power, people in seats of influence that use their seats of influence against Christ and against his people and against faith. It's a reality. It's all around us. Bullies. Bullies that hop on our live beam and try to uh, uh, hijack our messaging systems. And they wouldn't be doing that if we weren't preaching the truth. If I were up here today telling you that the Home Depot was the best place to buy your new car and that 5 plus 5 equal 12, no one would jump on that live feed and try to hijack it. But because you're getting the truth of the Word of God, people are constantly attacking what we're trying to do because it is the truth. And they are nothing more than fallen bullies that are using their knowledge, their power, their influence to stop the ministry of the Word of God. They're all around us. So watch this in Numbers chapter number 13. When you get there, just say amen. And we'll look at it in verse number 30. Now, some of you are still trying to figure it out. Like, wait a minute, you don't buy a, home, a car at Home Depot. You missed the point. <laughs> if it wasn't true, people wouldn't be attacking it. Watch this in Numbers chapter 13. If you're there, say amen. And we'll look at it in verse number 30. And Caleb stealed the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. What's Caleb talking about? He's talking about taking the promised land. Because they had made it out of Egypt. God had led them out miraculously. They had crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. They had spent 40 years in the wilderness. God sent manna from heaven, a cloud by day, fire by night. Water came out of a rock. He's got them right here at the threshold of the promised land. He had already told them, when you get to this land of promise, there will be seven nations of people occupying your land. All seven of them are bigger than you, mightier than you, stronger than you, but I'm going to go before you, and I'm going to drive those enemies out of that land, and you will occupy the land that I have promised you. When they got to the promised land, they didn't take God at his word. They sent in spies to go spy out the land. Is it real, really filled with, with grapes and, and pomegranates? Is it really filled with milk? And honey, is it really what they've said it is? And they went in the promised land. They came back with their hands filled with grapes. And they said, it's everything that we heard and more. But there are giants. I'm, we're going to read it here in a minute. There are giants on the land. And we're like little grasshoppers. They're so big and mighty. We could never take this land because it's occupied by giants. And so the, these Philistines... These large men were used by the enemy as pawns to intimidate the children of God that they couldn't have what God said. And in all of our lives, there are these giants, that they're, they're, they're just pawns of the enemy that tell us what we can't do and what we can't have, and they're always opposing a position that God's called his church to take. That they're always opposing the position that God has called you to take, and they use their influence to, to intimidate you from taking possession of what God said was yours, and that's what they're doing right here. But there's this man by the name of Caleb that believed God, and he said, I'm not worried about any giant. We can overcome them. We can take the land, verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel. The evil report didn't mean it was a lie. The evil report went against what God said. And sometimes we get a report and it's an evil report. It doesn't mean it's a lie. The report is real. It's just that that report doesn't have to mean the end. And let me say this while I'm talking about a report. I've got a dear friend who's a pastor and a doctor. Most of you know Dr. McFarland. And, and I know his heart, and I know his faith, and I know uh, he puts faith before anything. And, and, and I, I've known many doctors of faith and may have some here right now. I don't like it when we make the doctor's report the devil's report because all a doctor can report is what the tests show. 
So I would rather call it the medical report because it's not that the doctor just wrote something that wasn't true. It's that the doctor saw something. I recently went and saw a doctor over a situation I'm having with my shoulder, and he wrote some big word I can't pronounce. Basically, it's called weightlifter shoulder. I said, man, that sounds good. I got weightlifter shoulder. I'm believing God for healing of it because it's really limiting some things that I want to do. And even today when Calvin was ministering about Jesus being a healer, I was standing in faith that he would heal my shoulder, not necessarily of the doctor's report because I know the doctor that gave me the report and he's a good man, a man of faith. The point is, is that sometimes we get a report and that report was not authored by man. It's just the fact of what's going on. But Isaiah said, if we would believe God's report, we would see his arm revealed. Sometimes it's okay to get a report of what's going on. Don't be afraid of the report. Just because you got a report that said something bigger than you was in the land didn't mean you wouldn't take the land. Just because you got a report that cancer was in your body didn't mean you wouldn't live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Just because you got a report that your job was laying off didn't mean you wouldn't get a better job. My point is, is that the report does not speak to your destiny. So don't make any report evil by making a decision based on that report. Are y'all with me? So they brought this report up, and it was real. There were people in the land bigger than they were. God already told them there would be. Verse 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of what? Great stature. And there we saw the giants. Read that out loud. And there we saw the giants. This is post-flood. The sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as what, church? grasshoppers and so we were in their sight so these were great men that were fallen not fallen angels fallen away from God fallen from the will and word and purpose of God unbelieving heathen lost alienated from the covenant of God advancing false gods and attacking the children of God these were just fallen bullies that occupied a land that wasn't even theirs and told the rightful heir of the land you can't have what's yours and today we have individuals that have taken seats of authority and influence that point at people of faith and point at you and say you can't have what God said you could have. Fallen bullies are a reality. What I am concerned about in the church in these last days is that the church gets silent in these last days afraid of the fallen bullies who threaten us. I read a report done by Pew Research that 52% of the countries on planet Earth are now hostile toward Christianity. So it's, it's ever-growing. Do you know every day 13 Christians die in the world because of their faith? 13 every single day. There is an attack against Christianity and against our positions of influence. I have a dear friend of mine who travels this country preaching. He's been here and he's told me, Pastor James, thank you for the liberty of word of God. You never tell me what I can't preach in the Bible. But yet he's told by certain churches when he gets there, don't preach from Genesis. Don't mention male and female. Where he is given a a list of things he is not to bring up from the pulpit because the pastor of that church or whoever leads that church doesn't want anyone to be offended by what's coming out of that church so that he is silenced on certain issues in the word of God. Those are spiritual fallen bullies that won't allow the word of God to go forward and they are real in our world. They exist in church religion, they exist in politics, government, and they exist in the economy. They are people of great wealth and they use Use their influence to stop the message of faith. Well, let's see what happens in chapter 14. Chapter 14. Man, this ought to stir you up. Watch this. 
So they wanted a new captain. They saw these giants and they said, we need a new captain. Verse 4, they said one to another, let us make us a captain and let us return into Egypt. The children of Israel wanted to go back to Egypt all because of the giants in the promised land. The giants intimidated them to the point they wanted to go back where they came from. And God was provoked. God was provoked. He was provoked because they, 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 they kept denying his word. And so he goes on to say in verse 21, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have tempted me now these 10 times and not hearkened to my voice. 10 is a number that represents order, God's order in the earth through man. It is made up of the number four, which represents something that God is doing in the earth, and the number six, which is the number of man. God wants to do something through men in the earth. That's why the Ten Commandments have four commandments about our relationship with God and six commandments about our relationship with man. God has said, you now have told me ten times you are not going to take a land that I gave you to fulfill my promise and my word. You have tempted me these ten times. Verse 23, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. So they would not ever see the promised land because of the fear and the intimidation of those that occupied that land. Verse 24, and here's who we want to be. But my servant Caleb, oh come on somebody, but my servant Caleb Read up to that comma out loud with me, Shreveport Bozier, because he had another spirit with him. I couldn't hear you one more time. Because he had another spirit with him. Caleb was of a different spirit. Caleb was of a different spirit. And notice what else, what else about him. Read the next statement. And hath followed me Fully. Now let's read that whole verse out loud together. Ready? Read. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Caleb and his seed will have what I said, because Caleb had a different spirit with him, and Caleb hath followed me Fully, he wasn't intimidated. He didn't say, well, I'll believe this chapter, but I don't think I believe that one. I believe that, but I take that book out. No, he believed God fully. He had a different spirit. And we, the church of Jesus Christ today, need to operate in this world by a different spirit, by the spirit of the living God, and make a decision to follow God fully and not be ashamed of what he said in Genesis and not be ashamed of what Jesus said and not pick and choose from the word of God, but but take our position in the authority of the Word of God and refuse to be intimidated. In a politically correct society, refuse to be intimidated. Because our world right now is hostile towards faith. And I'm not sure everybody recognizes it. Just how hostile our world is today toward people of faith. Now, you might wonder how this shows up in the New Testament. Well, I assure you that it does. Go with me to the book of Acts. I want to go to the fourth chapter. Acts chapter number four. And I want to show you how this uh, affected the church in the New Testament. Fallen bullies. Fallen bullies. Intimidating the body of Christ. Silencing the gospel. Silencing the teaching of the word of God. Fallen bullies. They existed in the days of Noah. They existed in the days of the children of Israel taking the promised land. They existed in King David's day. They might look different today, but they still exist. Satan don't need a snake to talk to you. And your enemy doesn't have to be 9-9. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? got all kind of people tell you what, what can never be, what can never happen. They don't know God, and they don't know his word. They try to silence your faith, telling you that you can open in prayer, but don't use the name of Jesus. That's a fallen bully. You can have any kind of book on your desk, but you can't bring the Bible to work. That's a fallen bully. 
Amen. Amen. Jude chapter 1, verses 16 through 19 speaks of it. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 17 through 19 speaks of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 speak of it. Modern day, last day bullies that try to silence the message of the gospel. It's real in our lifetime. Watch this in the book of Acts, the fourth chapter. When you get there, just say amen. Tell your neighbor, don't be afraid of fallen bullies. Are you in Acts chapter 4? All right, watch this starting in verse 7. And when they had sent them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Because a man that had been broken in, uh, uh, his whole life was healed and made whole. And they said, what name, what name, by what name did you just do this? Well, Peter's going to answer and say it was by the name of Jesus. Well, that didn't go over, go over very well. We had one of our own ministers at a recent council meeting here in Shreveport when talking about crime and what's affecting our city. Stand up and say that our city needed Jesus, that our homes needed restored. Spoke the truth from the Word of God and was heckled. Heckled. Get out of here with that. But there, there was somebody else that said we needed more video game. That more video gaming would keep the people off the streets and from shooting one another. No heckling. The point is, is that there's always been people in seats of influence that don't want to let the name of Jesus and the authority of the Word of God be advanced. There's no respect for it. I read recently that out of 16,000 petitions for exemption in our military from vaccination, only 15 were honored. 15 out of 16,000 requests. Six Marines and nine from the Air Force. That was a media outlet publication in February of 2022. No respect for people's faith. No respect for religion. That's what we're seeing in our world today. COVID showed it to us. You leave a strip club open. You left that open. You left casinos open. But you made churches shut down. Pastors were arrested. Church members arrested for assembling during COVID. We act like we did not see it. Our world is hostile toward people of faith. We're living in it right now. They, they, they are modern day giants. They're, they're people in power that use their positions to intimidate. If we'll open our eyes, it's all around us. It's no different than it was here in Acts chapter 4. The name of Jesus was changing lives, but notice what, what they did in verse number 17 of Acts 4. But that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly do what? Threaten them. That they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Now you may not be in a seat of influence. And you may not have been affected by somebody in a seat of influence trying to silence your preaching. But how intimidated are you to bring up Jesus to somebody in the streets? How intimidated are you to share the gospel with somebody in your family? What is it about the name of Jesus or the word of God that we get silent? We can talk about football. We can talk about uh, a politics. We can talk about all kinds of But we won't bring up faith. We won't bring up the name of Jesus. Why? Because we've allowed the giants, the, 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 the pawns of our day, to silence this message. And, and I'm telling you that you'd be amazed what happened if you just opened your mouth. Would you tell your neighbor, don't be intimidated? So they tried to stop the preaching of the name of Jesus in verse number 17. So how did the church respond? What did the church do to the gospel being illegal? Watch verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus 
But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you judge. In other words, no, we got to either listen to you or we're going to listen to God. We choose to listen to God. Drop down to verse 25. He's now going to quote Psalms 2, verse 1. And Psalms 2, verse 1 says, Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth stood up. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. What, what has the enemy used throughout history? He, he has used government to stop the message of faith. Go with me as quick as you can to the Old Testament book of Daniel. And I want to go to the sixth chapter, Daniel chapter number six. And I'm going to show you right here in the Word of God what the enemy's doing in these days. The enemy is using government, not just in America, all over the world, to write laws that make the law of God illegal. In other words, the enemy is going to advance something and make it law. Like I just, I just heard of a state that's pushing it, uh, 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 legislation to make it illegal for a parent to stop their child from changing their gender. In other words, if your child decides they want to change their gender and you try to stop it, then now you need to be prosecuted. That's happening in, the, in America today. And we're just sending back the church, we won't say nothing about it. We're letting, we're letting social media and news media and all these other folks intimidate us and, and teach and educate our children. Amen. Amen. And nobody will say nothing because there, there's fear that, that, you know, we're going to be shut up or shut down. Well, shut, we try, I'm not going to be moved. I, I, let me tell you something. I would rather die standing for what's right than live standing for what's wrong. We, we, we got to get back to the Word of God and recognize what's really going on because a lot of stuff that's being legislated don't have anything to do with the people. It has everything to do with the silencing of faith. And I'm going to show it to you that it's nothing new. It, it happened in Daniel's day. Watch this in Daniel chapter 6. If you're there, say amen. Verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom. Over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first, this Hebrew believing Jewish teenage boy who was exiled in the Babylonian kingdom is preferred above everybody. Now, you know some folk didn't like that. Verse 3, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Daniel was going to be in this seat of influence where he could advance his own faith that he had already uh, advanced. And there were folks saying, no, we're not having this. So watch verse 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. Concerning the kingdom. But he didn't so much as even steal a company ink pen. That ain't what it reads, but that's the point. They could not find none occasion nor fault. See it? In other words, he handled his business in excellence, which is what led him to the top. But they don't want him at the top because he's a believer. He's a child of God. And they got to get rid of him. But they can't get rid of him because he does his business. So they said, what are we going to do to silence his influence? Here's what they did. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Read it with me out loud, Shreveport Bossier, verse 5. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So what did they do? They wrote a new law. 
If you read, they go to King Darius and they say, let's write a new law. Verse 7, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together. They held a Senate hearing to establish a royal statute. And to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. They made it illegal to pray. Knowing that Daniel prayed every day. The law was not for the king. The law was not for the advancement of the kingdom. The law was to push Daniel to his limits to find him in a position beneath reproach. They wrote the law so they could do something with him. And there are laws today being written that force a preacher and force a believer and force a pastor or a president of a Christian school to have to make a decision. Will I follow the law of man when you say a boy can be a girl? Or do I follow the law of God that says he made them male and female? The church is being forced between two where the one will become illegal. That's why the, the church today has got to get over party and politics and start looking at people. If you're going to elect somebody, you got to know who that person is. Do, do you have faith? Are you a believer? What is your position when it comes to the Word of God? Because I don't need somebody else taking office that becomes a pawn of somebody else being used by somebody else to advance an agenda. Follow the money, honey. Follow the money. So many people in power today are just put there by somebody else. Fallen bullies. But you know what the church did when they were told they couldn't preach in Acts 4? Verse 31 said they prayed. They prayed and they said, God, give us power. Give us power that we will not be threatened. Give us power that we will not be intimidated. And the Bible says they prayed that God would give them power. And Acts 4, 31 says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. They were like Caleb. They had a different spirit. And if the church today is going to be salt and light, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be silent. We must preach his name. We got two Shreveport Sport Trans City buses are going all over Shreveport with the name of Jesus on it. I had somebody stop me and said, ain't that illegal? I mean, what's it illegal about? We paid for it. The buses are used for advertisement. We paid the fee to advertise the name of Jesus. You telling me, did you ask an attorney if that was illegal? Did you ask if that company was legal? Did you ask anybody else if they were legal in putting their name on a bus? Why would it be illegal to put the name of Jesus on a bus? Hey, y'all about to stir me up in here. I'm not going to name everybody's name that's on a bus, but I bet you they were not asked if that was legal. Are you going to ask me if it's legal for us to put a commercial on NFL football that says Jesus changes everything? Is it legal? I don't care whether it's legal or not. I, will, I, I am ready to put the name of Jesus out there because I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. And I will not be threatened by a fallen bully. I will not be threatened by a fallen bully. Can you say that out loud? I will not be threatened by a fallen bully. I'm not going to be silent. The only hope for our world is the saving knowledge of Jesus. And why were they so mad in Acts chapter 4 that Jesus was healing people and delivering people, that people that were once laid out on stretchers now could go do for themselves? Because once they got free, they were no longer pawns of the kingdom. I'm convinced today's government 
wants us dependent, will pay you not to work. And you think it's a blessing? No, it's not a blessing. It's a curse. Because once they become your provision, they become your God. And when they become your God, you have to answer to your God. And I'm not going to answer to anybody but Jesus. I bow my knee to nobody but Jesus. He is one that I give my allegiance to. He's the one I swear my life to. You're not going to make me subject. In the early days of Word of God Academy, we had all these government things. Hey, you can get this grant. You can get this money. You can get this. I said, no, we don't want no government money. I said, because as sure as we start taking government money at a Christian school, they're going to come in here and tell us what we got to do. And I'm not going to let no boy in my girl's bathroom. No. Keep your money. The world is messed up. And they don't care about these kids, and they don't care about in these individuals that they supposedly are for their uh, 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 lobbyists. They don't care. It is all about writing laws that make faith illegal. That's all it is. But the church has got to wake up, but the church can't wake up because this has affected pulpits. Well, the bullies have told the preachers what they can't say. Amen. We need to be stirred up. <laughs> Fallen bullies. I can put Nike on my shirt and come to work, but I can't wear Jesus. You're a fallen bully. My First Amendment right, even outside the Word of God, is the freedom to use my voice and the freedom to speak. And there are too many Americans that have allowed themselves to be silenced by fallen bullies. We can't let these people intimidate us so that we silence our gospel and silence the word of hope and faith and salvation that is in the name of Jesus. So you ask me the question, are there giants in the land? Yes. It's time to face them. Don't be intimidated. Ask your neighbor, what are you scared of? Daniel said, they said, pray again. Pray again. Pray again. We're going to throw you in a den of lions. Daniel said, I bet I pray. <laughs> he didn't hold no assembly. He was in his own room, in his own private doing his own thing, and he prayed, and they heard him out his window. And they went, and even the king himself didn't want it to happen. He was up all night, walking the floor. Oh, man, what have I done signed in the law? What have I done signed in the law? Oh. It was a pawn. I'm convinced some of these people in, in Washington don't even know what they're signing. And it's certainly true of the president we got right now. I wonder what he knows anything. It's just sad. Amen. I ain't trying to speak his prayer. I'm just saying. Somebody, somebody, uh-uh. Pawns. Pawns. Do you know what you just signed? Go back to Daniel. He said, we're going to throw you in the lion's den. He prayed anyway. They threw him in the lion's den. And I don't know how God did it, but he did it. He shut the mouths of the lion. That's where the word catnap came from. I feel like praising him. Then when King woke up next morning, looked in there, and that Daniel was taking a cat nap. He done named them all. What's some Lion King names? Huh? He done named the lions, man. Tame them bad boys. Because he wasn't intimidated. Glory to God. I'm out of time. Let's pray. We'll get into it. Okay, Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would stop being afraid of fallen bullies. They try to scare us and intimidate us into their worldviews. 
May we ever cling to the truth of your word and never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And with every head bowed, all eyes closed, what fallen bullies do you have in your life? Do you go to school with them, work with them? They're all around us. They use intimidation, manipulation, domination, and exaggeration to advance their will upon us. And it's time for the church to unite. I'm talking about Second Church on 3rd Street and 4th Baptist Church on 5th Street and 6th Assembly of God Church on 7th Street. It is time for all that name the name of Jesus to unite. We got to stop being divided by denomination. We got to stop being divided by skin color. We've got to unite in the name of Jesus. There is a dark world that needs salvation. There is a dark world that needs truth. We don't want to go and pull on anybody that's already faithful and already serving in their church. We want to win the lost to Christ that don't know him, that are out of his will and word, that don't know his grace, love, and salvation. That's who we want to reach. Lord, forgive us for being intimidated. Forgive us for allowing our faith to be silenced. And as you did the church in Acts 4, fill us, we ask with your spirit that we could bring forth your word, your truth with conviction so we can see more saved and born again and loved by you and us and our cities change. We pray for men and women of God who are not fallen, but believe to take the seats of influence. We pray for Christians to rise up and to take the seats, Lord God, in authority. We pray for police chiefs all over the United States. We pray for seats in, 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 in courthouses and, and DAs and mayors and governors. Lord, we pray for people of, of, of faith to take these seats of influence that know you, that know your spirit, that know your wisdom, that know your word, that will use that seat without influence of money and corruption and use it for truth and love, mercy and justice, God, that our cities change in the name of Jesus. I pray for Shreveport. I pray for Bossier. I pray for the city that I was born in that so many of us love despite the crime and the murders that's happening here. Week after week, God, we pray that you would save our city. Save our city, Lord. Raise up leaders that have truth and that have compassion, that actually care about the well-being of its citizens and not their own agenda or their own future or their own gain. We pray, God, that you would do something in Shreveport as a model to all cities across the nation and the world, that if you could do it here, you could do it anywhere. Lord, we pray that you would raise up new leaders, spiritual, political, social leaders in this city and and, and, and Lord, change this community, we ask in Jesus' name, by the power of your spirit. Amen. I'm tired of the culture of death. They're trying to kill us in the womb. They're trying to kill us in the streets. I'm tired of a culture of death. I'm ready for a culture of life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus, save our cities. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, I believe you love me. Now you sent your son to die for me. You raised him from the dead so I could know your power and walk in newness of life. Use my life for the advancement of your kingdom to bring you glory and fulfill my purpose. Fill me with the power of your spirit, faith in your word, confidence in your truth. Make me unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that I never fear a fallen bully. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Can we shout about it? Glory to God. I went way over, so let's stand together, both campuses. If you need prayer, come forward. Otherwise, greet somebody on the way out. I love you. With that, you are dismissed. See you Wednesday, 630.